Ecuador's National Assembly approved the creation of a truth commission to investigate the events that took place during the national strike. The Argentinian government rejected the UK's decision to declare the occupied territory of the Malvinas as protected areas. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa delivers a eulogy at the memorial service for the 21 teens who died at the township tavern last month. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. Ecuador's National Assembly approved the creation of a truth commission to investigate the events that took place during the national strike and to provide pre reparations for the victims. With the unanimous vote of the 110 assembly members, the parliament recommended to the Ombudsman's office that the truth commission be constituted with the participation of independent experts representing social organizations as well as national and international human rights organizations. The entity pointed out that the purpose of the commission will be to establish truth, justice, and reparation for the possible victims who show evidence of human rights violations due to the repression by the government of Guillermo Lazos during the mobilizations of indigenous organizations. Brazilian presidential candidate Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva met with Brazilian businessmen and bankers in Sao Paulo, southeast Brazil, on Tuesday. Accompanied by his running mate, Geraldo Acumin, and former education minister Fernando Haddad, the candidate closed a series of meetings with which he seeks to ease concerns about the policies contemplated in his left wing and progressive government program. Businessmen described the meeting as a necessary and positive high level space. The candidate has intensified his meetings with Brazil's business elite in recent weeks and although on several occasions he has stated that he does not expect any bankers to vote for him, he recognizes the importance of reaching out to all sectors and contributing to calm and harmony. Brazil's Senate will begin debates on Wednesday on the creation of a parliamentary commission of inquiry to investigate corruption scandals in the Ministry of Education. The president of the Brazilian Senate, Rodrigo Pacheco, said that the debate will take place this Wednesday and Thursday, although the implementation of the parliamentary commission of inquiry would take place after the Brazilian elections. Pacheco assured that the Senate recognizes the relevance of the Commission to investigate the illegal activities of the Ministry of Education, illegal deforestation in the Amazon, organized crime, and drug trafficking. The purpose is to investigate the irregularities observed in the Ministry of Education and the possible link with the Brazilian president. Luis Arce, president of Bolivia, has ordered an investigation into allegations related to contributions to the electoral campaign of the movements to socialism. Indigenous leader Evo Morales has backed and welcomed the decision. The accusations made by the deputy of the movement to socialism, Rolando Suela, that would link militants of the government party with an alleged financing of drug trafficking will be investigated. Gerardo Garcia, leader of the movement to socialism, was accused of accepting funds from a well-known Argentine drug trafficker. The former president Evo Morales has assured that the allegations are false and therefore must be clarified in an open investigation and visible one. Of course, Gabriela, President Arce has referred the matter to the Ministry of Justice. The Ministry of Transparency has opened a case and has initiated an investigation into this matter. There are different situations that have to be seen. It is the responsibility of the Electoral Tribunal in the matter that opposition deputies have requested. It is also the responsibility of the Ministry of Justice through the Vice Ministry of Transparency because this is definitely a fact that is sanctioned by the law. Marcelo Quiroga Santa Cruz and there is also the possibility for the public ministry to activate mechanisms that it has in its organic law. They are responsible for penal actions and in this case there are accusations made for which there will be an investigation but as the Ministry of Justice we have received a mandate from the President to investigate and to give an answer to the Bolivian people on this issue and that Bolivian people should in no way be left without an answer.
In Venezuela, the Attorney General Tarek William Saab announced that he will provide elements of conviction to charge with murder those responsible for the disappearance of the revolutionary leader, Carlos Lanz. Tarek William Saab holds a press conference on Wednesday where he will give more information about the investigations carried out by the public ministry on the disappearance of the Venezuelan militant. He will also reveal the details that incriminate the alleged perpetrators of what he described as an abominable crime. On August 8, 2020, the well-known politician, sociologist, and revolutionary militant Carlos Lanz was seen for the last time in Maracay, Aragua State, and since then his whereabouts have been unknown. Several regions of Mexico have been affected by heavy rains caused by Hurricane Bonnie, which rose to Category 3 on the Sapphire Simpson scale on Tuesday. According to the National Weather Service, the hurricane is still about 350 kilometers southwest of Punta San Telmo and in the state of Monchacuan, and almost 400 kilometers southwest of the city of Cihuatanejo in the state of Guerrero. Its westward movement continues with maximum winds of 158 kilometers per hour. The Meteorological Service points out points out that due to the interaction with low pressure channels, the storm will increase the probability of heavy to very heavy rains in the center and south of the territory with high possibilities of causing overflows and flooding. In Italy, authorities declared a state of emergency in five northern regions in response to the historic levels of drought affecting the river pool. The initiative will allow the government to bypass legislative processes and take immediate actions such as implementing the imposition of water rationing for homes and businesses. The decree also pledged initial funds of 36.5 million euros for the regions of Emilia-Romagna, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, Lombardy, Piemonte and Veneto to help them cope with water shortages. The Po is the longest river in Italy and runs for more than 650 kilometers through the north of the country, providing about a third of the country's agricultural production. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. The Argentinian government has rejected the decision of United Kingdom authorities, which have declared the occupied territory of the Malvinas as protected areas. Buenos Aires warns that these actions are unilateral, illegitimate, and incompatible with the provisions of the United Nations General Assembly. Boris Johnson's administration has ignored previous talks with the Argentinian Foreign Ministry and even those between the British Prime Minister and President Alberto Fernandez at G7 summit when London announced the move to extend the Convention on the Biological Diversity of the Malvinas and the Argentinian government rejected it. The United Kingdom cannot adopt decisions that unilaterally modify the situation of the territory as reaffirmed by the United Nations. Given the death of the Downing Street crisis, even the United States ambassador to Argentina, Mark Stanley, questioned Johnson's intentions to continue negotiations on the matter. I am learning more about the issue every day. I'm studying a lot and if I had to think of a way to solve this, but I can't right now, I can't think of anything. The only thing I would like to say is that I would like to see a negotiation between the two parties. Boris Johnson the other day seemed to have no interest in continuing the negotiations when he spoke with President Fernandez, but this is still a very complicated matter. At least eight people were injured on Tuesday after a shooting in the south of Port au Prince, Haiti's capital. According to the president of the Association of Owners and Drivers of Haiti, Meu Shanju, the shooting occurred in the middle of a clash in Martisan, a poor commune of the capital, when a bus with passengers traveling to the commune Carrefour in the same city was shot at. At least five people with serious injuries and three others with minor wounds were confirmed. 
The figures of criminal violence in Haiti continue to rise and the number of dead, injured and displaced people are also growing exponentially. According to UN figures, at least 20,000 displacements have been recorded in the Haitian capital alone in just one month. In the United States, the state of New Jersey on Tuesday approved tougher new laws restricting the possession of firearms despite the Supreme Court ruling the right to carry weapons in public last month. After New Jersey State Governor Phil Murphy signed the new regulations, the state joins New York City and others like Massachusetts and California, which currently have severe restrictions in place. The measure provides for gun permit training, registration of every gun purchase in other states, and a ban on .50 caliber weapons. The ruling now replaces the New York state law which requires gun licenses to show good cost to carry a gun. A delegation of the Truth Commission on Colombia presented its final report to the Spanish Foreign Ministry and hopes that public events will be held to disseminate the document. The text, which, has wa which was prepared in Colombia since 2019, was received by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation, Jose Manuel Álvarez. The Foreign Ministry recalled that the peace accords in Colombia were carried out with the help of the Iberian country. For their part, the members of the Truth Commission hope that meetings will be held with citizens living in Spain, mainly in Madrid, Bilbao and Barcelona, in order to publicize the Commission's findings. Amid a surge in death and COVID-19 infections in some Latin American and Caribbean countries, Brazil is on its way to take the leading position again as one of the most affected countries in Latin America. In the last 24 hours, Brazil has registered 369 new COVID-19-related deaths, the highest since last March, 485 figure. The South American nation, one of the hardest hit by the pandemic, registered to date 672,429 deaths and more than 32.5 million infections after recording 74,591 positive cases this Tuesday. In spite of these numbers, the vaccination plan is considered by experts as effective, avoiding further complications in those infected. However, experts recognize the worsening of the situation and reiterate the need to return to the measures that help to lessen the pandemic's effect in what is still today the country with the second highest death toll in the region. We return to a sad world leadership, but beyond that it is necessary to resume the mandatory use of masks in close environments such as school and leisure establishment, such as theaters, cinemas, and others. Russia has created two humanitarian corridors in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, which, according to the Defense Ministry, are completely safe for navigation. The Black Sea corridor operates from a.m. local time to 7 p.m. and is 139 miles long and 3 miles wide, allowing navigation out of the ports of Kherson, Nikolaev, Okakov, and Yuzhny in the direction of the territorial sea of Ukraine. On the Azov Sea Corridor, said General Mikhail Misensev, head of the National Center of Defense Management, the corridor operates 24 hours a day and is 115 miles long and 2 miles wide for navigation from the port of Mariupol towards the Black Sea. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov had already confirmed that these corridors can be used by any cargo ship waiting to leave one of these ports, and all that is required is that Ukraine clears the adjacent strip of sea of mines. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi continues his tour of several Southeast Asian countries and began an intense day of work together with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. The leader of the Foreign Ministry arrived in the Philippines on Wednesday and had a fruitful exchange with his counterpart Enrique Manalo on bilateral issues. In this sense, Wang Yi became the first Foreign Minister to be received by the new government of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Experts 
said that the visit of the Beijing spokesman came at a crucial moment when the United States is seeking to involve the Philippines in its confrontational strategies over the Taiwan issue. On the other hand, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov arrived in Vietnam and will meet with China to strengthen defense and trade relations. More news coming up after a final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. On Wednesday, South Africa bid farewell to 21 people, mostly teens, who died in unclear circumstances at a township tavern last month in an incident that shocked the nation. Empty coffins were allowed for the ceremony, with families expected to bury their children later this week. The youngsters died in what survivors have described as a battle to escape the jam-packed venue. The fatalities bore no visible signs of injury and officials have ruled out a stampede as the cause of death. A this investigation is still ongoing. The President of South Africa, Silvio Ramaphosa, delivered a eulogy at the memorial and announced that bars caught selling alcohol to those underage would be shut down permanently moving forward. Drinking in South Africa is permitted for over eight hours. To say yes, from national government, there is blame on us. Provincial government, local government, the police, the taverners, the tavern owners, and all that. There is blame. And blame must be laid at the feet of those who are making money of the dreams and the lives of young people of South Africa by breaking the law and selling alcohol to underage children. The Secretary General of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, Engineer Mohamed Barakindo, died on Wednesday in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. The news was confirmed by Mele Kiare, head of the Nigerian Oil Corporation, who in a tweet mourned the loss of the oil expert. Barakindo, 63 years old, was in the Nigerian capital to participate in the Energy Summit. According to information provided by the presidential office, he had held a meeting minutes before his death with the country's president, Muhammad Abuhari. Barakindo's career began in 1980 in Nigeria, his native country, where he chaired the National Oil Corporation, and from there he went to OPEC. Muhammad Barakindo was at the head of OPEC in a very turbulent period exacerbated by the crisis in Ukraine. In one of his last public interventions, he suggested allowing the trade of Iranian and Venezuelan crude oil to alleviate the shortage. Suspected Boko Haram militants using guns and explosives blasted their way into a prison near Nigeria's capital, freeing hundreds of inmates in an operation to release jail camarades. The Tuesday night's attack on the outskirts of Abu Abuja came hours after an ambush on a presidential security convoy in the northwest in a fresh illustration of the struggle Nigeria faces to overcome a security crisis. Outside the jail, the burned-out wreckage of bus and cars marked the scene of the attack, and yellow police tape was stretched across a destroyed part of the prison perimeter. Senior Interior Ministry official Shuai Bubelkor said authorities have retrieved about 300 out of about 600 inmates that escaped. Boko Haram is one of the armed groups involved in Nigeria's grinding 13-year conflict in the country's northeast. Boris Johnson on Wednesday refused to quit as British Prime Minister despite a slew of resignations from his scandal-hit government. The Prime Minister's grip on power appears to be slipping following 10 short minutes on Tuesday night when Rishi Sunak resigned as finance minister and Sajid Javid quit as health secretary. Both said they could no longer tolerate the culture of scandal that has stalked the prime minister for months. Johnson has suffered an exodus of ministers in just 24 hours, mounting to a total of 33 so far. Among the latest to present their resignation are employment minister Mims Davis, minister for safeguarding Rachel McLean, and housing PPS Duncan Baker. At this moment, Boris Johnson rules out snap elections as resignations mount. I continue to give the benefit of the doubt. And now this week again, 
we have reason to question the truth and integrity of what we've all been told. And at some point, we have to conclude that enough is enough. Yeah. I believe that point is now. But I do fear that the reset button can only work so many times. There's only so many times you can turn that machine on and off before you realise that something is fundamentally wrong. Norway's government has intervened amid recent strikes and labour disputes at several oil fields which have further raised tensions and prices in Europe. The Minister of Labour and Social Inclusion, Martin Munoz Persen, announced the imposition of a compulsory wage war as a way to remedy the conflict between workers and Norwegian state on Ekinor. The measure follows stall negotiations between the parties and the threat of a general strike that could reduce the country's gas supply by more than 13 percent and further affect the European situation in the context of the Ukrainian crisis. The Minister of Equality said after announcing the decision that the current geopolitical situation in Europe and in the context of the energy crisis, her government had no other option but to impose the measure. Director General of the World Health Organization, Tedros Ghebreyesus, said the organization is concerned about the scale and spread of monkeypox, with more than 6,000 cases now confirmed in 58 countries. Testing remains a challenge, and it's, it's highly probable that there are a significant number of cases not being picked up. Europe is the current epicenter of the outbreak, recording more than 80 percent of cases globally. In Africa, cases are appearing in countries not previously affected and record numbers are being recorded in places which have previous experience with monkeypox. Telesur English continues to grow. Its signal now reaches Europe. You can order from your cable dealer or tune it yourself. These parameters that you see on screen are in place since July 1st. Quite soon, further changes will be implemented for the signals in the Middle East and Africa. Now, more than ever, the world connects to us and our stories are heard in other faraway nations. This news multi platform will continue providing truthful content to oppose the hegemonic media's narrative and our faithfulness to our audience. We have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.